So welcome all back from spring break. I hope um, it was relaxing or as relaxing as it could be for all of us. Um, it wasn't super relaxing for me, but it was an enjoyable spring break nonetheless. So that's good. Um, I got a number of questions and I'm getting a few more in the chat right now over spring break. I haven't addressed all of them. Some of them came late into the weekend and I haven't been able to reply yet. Um, but it makes me think we should kind of stop and do a mid-semester review. So instead of adding new content today, I'm going to stop and try to encourage questions. I haven't been super successful with questions. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, I haven't been super successful with encouraging you all to ask questions. Um, during these live sessions, but I'm going to try again. If nothing else, you can call me a fool for trying yet again. I'm going to try to do this mid-semester review and um, lead a little bit, but then also encourage you all to um, interrupt, stop me, say something, think about what we're doing, and try to reference it to things we think we remember from what seems like a year ago already, but just like two weeks ago. Um, so it looks like there's a few questions before we get started. I will um, not jump into whatever I have planned in our outline here, and I'll just give you time and space to ask questions before we get started. Um, Hayes, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, one okay. of the questions I had was on one of the lab problems regarding, it's like the sandwich one where it talks about the condiments. Okay. It says that there's 11 different condiments, but then you ask us about zero to 12 condiments. So I'm just trying, I, that sounds just like a typo to me. Yeah, because I was thinking it'd be zero to 11. Okay. Yeah. So what you're suggesting is this number is not matching these numbers. Yeah, I think Sometimes. on mine it said 11 at the top and then right. The if you all if y'all haven't found out by now, the labs are randomized. So the numbers that show up for each person each time you load the page are different. Um, I might be able to showcase that if I just click refresh. And so this time I think you are your point is better made, Hayes. This 13 should match here and here. But that's just a typo on my part. Um, it won't take long to fix. Hayes, thanks for uh, calling that out and bringing it to my attention. Clearly, I wanted those numbers to match, um, even though they don't. Uh, so I will update that um, as soon as I can. I won't drag you all through it right now, but I'll update it after class. Hayes, you should go off whatever number is up here in the preliminary of the question. Okay, and if I already submitted it and I reopen it, will it give me new numbers? Uh, yes, it will. Um, so essentially what I'm going to do since this number was clearly a typo on my part is I'm just going to try to be more relaxed about grading this one. So if you miss this one, I am not going to take points off of your lab essentially. Okay. And then the other question I had was for probabilities, do we leave that as like the original decimal or do we turn it into like a percentage? Uh, I prefer decimals. Okay, thank you. Yeah, totally. Thank you. You have okay, a, so, yeah, a number of significant figures that you uh, prefer? I always go with two. Okay. Um, I will try to show you guys, maybe I'll try to mention it a little bit later um, today, why I think two is totally acceptable for most things. Okay. Um, the short answer to that is two. Uh, if you remember back in the 60s, the United States made it to the moon on three mm -hmm. decimal places. Right. And so I think two is sufficient for us. Awesome. Thank there you, is, Yeah, totally. There is good mathematical justification for two um, in the world of statistics, at least. So I'll try to say something about that later on. But if it doesn't totally stick, that's OK. We'll come back to it eventually in this class. We got another question in the chat. Are these labs due at the end of each week? I encourage you to try to get them in um, near the time we introduce the material. I know that's a little hard because I um, 
released or I opened or I presented to you all four labs at once. And so it's a little bit hard to keep up with that. Technically, I'm not gonna collect the submitted lab assignments until the end of the semester. So you have until the end of the semester to turn them in. That's their official due date. But I encourage you to try to stay on top of them as best you can, because if you're coming back to some of these probability problems two or three or four weeks late, they're going to be exceptionally difficult. So I encourage you, though I don't require you, to follow along each week with these labs. Great. Thanks, Shaheem. I'm glad that settled an answer. Uh, and I've gotten a few comments from some students that you don't like the lack of structure in this class. I apologize. Um, on my end, I hear from way more students that have crazy life events happening and time frames are all out of whack and the ability to make it to these live sessions is nearly impossible or students have um, uh, you know, they're in different time zones that make it really difficult to attend everything in person. So I apologize if you don't appreciate the lack of formal structure here, but I think it's doing well for a good number of students who need added flexibility. Um, with that said, yep, yeah, that's my opinion too, thanks. With that said, uh, I'm gonna try to set up some uh, more structure by Fridays. Thank you, thank you, the chats, I appreciate them. Uh, I'm gonna try to set up more structure on Fridays for those who want it. It is not required, but if you want it, let's try to make Fridays some added structure. I can create some due dates for us so we can try to update our course notes in a reasonable time frame. Um, I can go over again and again and again, as much as you want extra material, or not extra material, material we've always already covered. If you just need to see it again or hear me talk about it again, I'm happy to do that. I'm going to do that in part today already, but um, I'm happy to go back to like weeks ago material on Fridays and just repeat whatever you all want. So on Fridays, let's just try to, at 10 or three o'clock, whichever works best for you, let's just try to um, attend if you can and if you want, but you're not required for uh, any kind of review, refresher, any kind of help you need for your course notes, whatever. If you want extra structure, please do that. If you're uh, good with what we've got going, then I will keep that going for the rest of the semester. Okay. That was a lot out of me. How about anybody else? Are there other questions we can get to before I start writing on this whiteboard? Wednesday still is office hours. Correct. Friday is really going to be office hours too. It'll still stand as office hours. I'm just going to try to make them a little bit more formal. Oh, Colin. So um, I was going to try to leave tutorials out of a review time period. So I was going to wait till next Monday. But because a question came up on the tutorials, let's go ahead and address it. So there is uh, the questions I usually have end up being about R. We're going to get to a little bit about R. I think we'll actually spend a majority of the rest of the um, period in R. So Renee, maybe your questions about R will be more appropriate then. So I'm pulling up the syllabus so that down here we can um, look at the tutorial section together. So in place of exams, you will write and submit two tutorials. Each tutorial will be about a different probability or statistical topic. I will um, highlight some topics here in a little bit. Uh, you get to choose the topics. Um, I ask you to approve them by me first, but if I'm giving you a list of topics, those topics are obviously approved. The only way I need you to um, approve your topic with me first is if you come up with an idea I haven't suggested to you all yet. But I encourage you to. That would make it for a lot more interesting material. 
The tutorials can be submit at any time. Um, I will try to suggest some general times for you all as we go through the semester um, from here forward with the final due date at the end of the semester. Um, I would like you to write these materials for future Math 350 students. So most of your course notes have been like for future you. So like Hayes is writing his course notes for future Hayes and Renee is writing the course notes for future Renee. I would like the tutorials to be for anybody. So I'd like you to try your best to introduce these topics to someone who has never seen them. Okay, so the essential idea is very similar to course notes, but I would like you to consider the audience for who might be reading these course notes different than in your course notes. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thanks. Okay, okay. Thanks for the one comment back. <laughs> yeah, definitely go over that more quickly. Tutorials are gonna be very similar to your course notes. You're gonna pick a topic and then you're going to write about that as if you are presenting the material to future Math 350 students. So think of it as like picking a section out of a textbook and you are to write that section in a textbook as if someone is coming to Math 350 and having never seen the material before. I want you to present the material. I want you to write it up in an R Markdown document separate from your course notes as if you are writing a section of a textbook for future Math 350 students. I want you to write it in R Markdown so as to create an HTML file. So for those of you that are totally into this idea and like really connect with what I'm trying to get you all to see, I encourage you to pick some specific topics that maybe you thought I introduced poorly, and then you, after many days and hours and maybe weeks of struggling through the concept, it made more sense to you. So maybe you're like, I don't like the way Edward introduced R, let me show you how to introduce R better. And so you create an, H, an R markdown, and thus once you knit it, an HTML file, you create an introduction to R would be a good example. Or say you think your current understanding of probability could make for a better introduction to it if you wrote it up in a different style. So then you would write about probability. One of your tutorial topics would be probability. One of your tutorial topics could be an introduction to R. One of your tutorial topics could be an introduction to R markdown. But the point is you're writing it for future Math 350 students. So you're gonna present it to people who um, have never seen this material before. So we could do like um, a focus on LaTeX that is platform independent. We don't have to Perfect. do all the work down. Okay. Correct. Yeah, if you wanna do LaTeX, that would be a great one. Thank you. If you wanna do expectation, I would encourage you to, oh, Nathan, great uh, follow-up. If you wanna do expectation, I'd encourage you to pick a specific function of expectation. So Nathan, I'm trying to answer your question by highlighting the course outline below. What I think you could use as specific topics is basically any bullet point on this course outline. So if you wanted to cover basic set theory, that would be fine, but I'd ask you to come up with your own examples, not examples I gave previously. If you wanna talk about random variables, which are neither random nor variables, but in fact, the word random variables is quite informative, I encourage you to pick random variables. If you wanna pick random variables, that's a great topic. 
If you want to pick expectation, I'd encourage you to pick something like the mean or just variance or just probability or just any of the other specific examples of expectation we'll look at. Expectation is too general, in my opinion, a topic for you all to introduce in a tutorial. I would encourage you to pick some specific function G, like probability is defined for indicator functions in general. The mean is defined for an identity function in general. The variance is an expectation defined for a very particular function. So I'd encourage you to pick a particular function and create a tutorial on expectation from that. Um, what would you consider a good length for the tutorial? I don't know how to say what will be a good length because once you create an HTML document, there are no pages, right? Like here is an HTML that I created from our markdown, but there's no obvious page breaks. So I this is the hardest part I've, I'll be honest with you, when I was coming up with this idea earlier in the semester, this is the hardest thing for me to um, conceptualize. I don't know what an appropriate length is, but I know what too short is. Too short is a half-assed approach to tutorials, but at the same time, they don't need to be too long. So what I tried to do, instead of telling you an exact length that the tutorials need to be, Jake, give me a second and then I'll come back to your question. When I try to tell you what length the, the tutorials need to be, what I've done instead is suggested a tutorial outline. I think tutorials should follow this basic pattern. There should be an introduction, one or two paragraphs, a specific example, a very general example that like highlights the mathematics behind it, and then a different specific example that maybe showcases a different aspect of the general definition different than your first example. So your first example is like something really easy. The general definition or whatever concept it is, is the mathematics behind it in all the mathematics glory. And then the follow-up specific example is um, something that showcases a different aspect of the general mathematics that maybe isn't as easy to see as your specific example was. And then a conclusion. And the conclusion is just like one more paragraph that's really easy. It almost seems like you're repeating yourself and you are. So how long should the tutorials be? They should be one to two paragraphs for an introduction to introduce the concept. There should be one specific example that is essentially another paragraph. There is one uh, to two paragraphs for a general discussion with mathematics. And then a follow-up specific example. And then a concluding paragraph. So that's one to two paragraphs here. One paragraph, one to two paragraphs here. So that's one, two, three to four paragraph, three to five paragraphs by here four to six and five to seven. So five to seven paragraphs, that includes three essential examples, a specific example, a general mathematical notation, I'm calling that one of the examples, and a final specific example. That's about the best I can do for you, Hayes. Okay, next up, Jake's question. So do you want us to make a specific example and work through it showing how students would work it? That's certainly an option is you could take as this different specific example, you could work through a calculation by hand. Like if we choose a uniform distribution, do we need to have fake data and describe what we're looking for? So Jake, if you are trying to write an example that is data specific, yes, then you'll need to create your own fake data. If you're trying to showcase something like a mean where you don't need data at all, 
then you won't need to fake data. You won't need to create fake data for anything. So your first question was easy to answer. Yes, if you want, create an example to work through. Uh, your second question is too specific, too context specific to give a general answer to. Um, are we allowed to get your opinion on our tutorials in office hours before submitting? Yes, of course, please stop by office hours and ask for my opinion on tutorials. I'm happy to give feedback in any way, shape or form on these. One question I have is a little bit advanced, but is there a way to show LaTeX symbols when using UI tooltip? If it's too advanced, can I come to office hours? Um, so when you're in our markdown, if I am interpreting your question right, then I'll show you the option. Do you mean a tooltip like this in HTML? Uh, so for the tooltip I was talking about, it's where like in the HTML, you put the mouse over it and the little like text will pop up. And when I was doing it, I couldn't get like the pie symbol to show. Right. Um, Hayes, that would be some pretty sophisticated JavaScript. I could help you get started on that, but that would be way outside the realm of this class. Okay, thank you. It, it really depends on your, um, uh, your experience with JavaScript there. Okay, so uh, next question. I know I like watching videos in the example that you do for some topics. Could we, for our different specific examples, create a short clip of us working an example problem with fake data in R? That is the best idea I've heard all semester. If you all want to create as your follow-up specific example, a short video of you working an example, whether it's pen and paper and or in R or our markdown, or however you wanna work an example, and then embed that in your HTML document, I think that would be spectacular. If you all wanna create a short video of you working a specific example in your tutorial, I think that would be fantastic. How would we insert a video into HTML? Off the top of my head, I don't know, but I can also guarantee it's probably pretty easy. So I'm going to look that up later today on how to embed a, a video in an R Markdown document. Um, I don't know how to do it off the top of my head, but a quick Google outside of class is probably going to give us an answer really quick. I bet somebody could do it on their own right here in the next five minutes and post to Piazza a solution to this problem, how to embed a video in um, an R Markdown document. Two tutorials, one topic for each, or two topics for each, uh, one topic per tutorial. So one tutorial, one topic, second tutorial, second topic. Does that make sense? Great, thanks, Mason. Okay. For some of us, I think this is going to sound like a lot of extra work. So here's what I'm going to do to suggest a strategy that's open to anyone to minimize the excess work that tutorials will create. If you want to pick a week's topic that you're going to add to your course notes, and instead of adding that material to your course notes, you write the tutorial on that topic and you include the tutorial in your course notes. So it saves you from having to double up on the creation of content in your notes. You'll write a tutorial instead of the course notes and then literally just include that tutorial in your course notes. Does that make sense? So if you think adding to your course notes in some week and creating a tutorial on the same topic is too much, just create the tutorial and include it in your course notes. I still want two files, one file for your tutorial and in your course notes, but I think that's a reasonable strategy to 
minimize workload. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes, it does. Thanks. Two tutorials, two separate HTML files, correct. So two tutorials on two topics, one topic per tutorial in two separate HTML files. Correct. For the by the end of the semester, you will submit three total files. By the end of the semester, you will submit three total files. Course notes, your first tutorial, and your second tutorial for three total files. Course notes, first tutorial, second tutorial for three total files by the end of the semester. And if you want to take these two tutorials and include them in your course notes, in place of some week's topic, that's totally okay. If you wanna take the two tutorials and include them in your course notes for a specific week's topics, that's totally okay. That way you don't have to overburden yourself with material. But I want your tutorials to address an audience that is not you. So you might have to like, in some sense, hold your audience's hand a little bit more. You'll have to help them through the material a little bit more. You can't use all your shortcuts or abbreviations that make sense to you, but don't make sense to anyone else. Great question. There's a, another question in the chat. Since there are topics we've revisited and learned more about, would we include the latest material in the tutorial even though it's more advanced. Uh, yes, I'd encourage you to include the latest material in the tutorials. Okay, in my mind, that was a really good um, series of question and answers. It wasn't content related, but it was course related. And this was good. I see in the chat that other people think this too. Um, no, that's totally okay. Thank you for suggesting it. It seemed to go really well. And a number of people seem to have um, similar ideas in mind. So we got, how about we go till my clock says 1030. My clock says 1028 right now. How about we spend the next like minute and a half giving space to other students who might have questions. And then if we don't, I'll use the last 20 minutes of class to go through my mid-semester course review. Um, I encourage you to submit labs weekly, but they are not due weekly. I encourage you to submit labs weekly because they will be easier if you stay on top of the material. But if life throws curveballs at you and you need to skip a week or two, that's totally fine. They're technically only due at the end of the semester. So I encourage you to send to submit labs weekly, but they're due by the end of the semester. Uh, okay, the next question in the chat, if some of the topics branch into other topics, would we give a short explanation on the subtopic? I would encourage you to either give a short explanation of the subtopic or create your second tutorial on that topic, on that subtopic. Okay, so if some of the topics branch into other topics, would we give a short explanation on the subtopic? I'd encourage you to either give a short explanation on the subtopic or to create your second tutorial on the subtopic itself. Okay, 
Can you send out a reminder for labs over email or Blackboard? I sure will after I take a note of that. Okay. Um, next question in the chat. Can we turn in labs more than once just in case we want to go to office hours to double check on the answers we turned in? That is exactly why I have made them as easy to um, obtain. I don't know what the right word here is. Um, but yes, you can turn in labs more than once. So if you have already submit a lab and then, but you haven't been able to make it to office hours, say you made it to office hours this coming Friday and you ask the question about a lab, you can turn in the lab again after having gotten help from me. You can submit labs as many times as you want until the end of the semester when I will collect them. So if halfway through the rest of the semester, you figure out that you answered all the probability questions wrong and you want to submit the labs again, you are more than welcome to submit the labs again. You can submit the labs as many times as you want until the end of the semester. And at any time you can stop the office hours to ask me about your answers. Okay, that was great. I gave you all a minute and a half to ask some follow-up questions and you all took uh, about three and a half minutes to ask follow-up questions. That's spectacular, thank you, thank you. Okay, one more question, then we'll get on to the mid-semester review. If you submit the lab on accident and use the back button, would it give you new random numbers? It will give you new random numbers if you use the back button. I know I did that once and everything I had written was still there, but I didn't think to check the question again. Okay, let me back up. Uh, it depends on your browser. I think Firefox has special features to return the exact same page you had before with your answers and all. I think, I think Firefox will do that for you. I think Chrome will refresh the page. So that one I'm a little 50-50 on. I don't have a great answer for you on that one. Okay, you all ready? We're gonna do mid-semester review. Sure, but I hope you took your answers down in R or pen and paper or somewhere. So you can at least just replace a, an 11 with a 13 as necessary and everything should work out. Good. Okay, we're gonna start with the two worlds of statistics. I think this is part of the reason why statistics is such an odd topic. It's like a two-faced coin. There's like two sides to it. Um, then we're gonna show how and why the world of mathematics can connect the two worlds of statistics. And then we'll try to do some examples in R. Okay, we have spent most of our time with distributions in this class. Now distributions give statisticians a way to represent the world around them. And what I mean by that is consider Bernoulli distributions with this um, value P. Now P can either be known, like if you know you have a fair coin, then P is 0.5. But P could equally be unknown. That is, there is um, a Bernoulli distribution that represents any election in the United States because there's generally only two parties. You can label one of the parties a one and the other party a zero. It really doesn't matter which way you go. And then the probability 
that you observe a one, that is any individual in the country will vote for the first party, is P. But we don't know what that P is. A Bernoulli distribution represents the world around us when the world can be put into two groups, either ones or zeros. Now, the crazy thing about the world of statistics is that you probably didn't think about these random things like this before, that if there's only two outcomes, you would name them one or zero. But in fact, that's the way statistics tries to train individuals to think, that instead of thinking of it as like Republican, Democrat, it would think as if to name one of the parties a one and name the other party a zero. It doesn't matter which you pick. Then in thinking about voting in the United States, you could ask an individual in the United States which party they're going to vote for. Are they gonna vote for one or are they gonna vote for zero? Normally before this class, you might have thought of you're going to either vote for Democrat or Republican. But this class is here to teach you that as long as there's only two outcomes, then you should name one of those outcomes one and name the other outcome zero. Now, the trickiest part about that is, well, how mathematically do we justify naming these things one and zero? And what we do is use random variables. So we think of capital X as an, a variable whose outcome is unknown. We think of random variables as a variable whose outcome is unknown. And what we imagine is that there is a bunch of random variables representing a bunch of individuals in the United States who are gonna vote for one party or the other. So each random variable X coming from a Bernoulli distribution could be a one or a zero. We think of these random variables as variables, in this case for a Bernoulli distribution, one or zero, whose outcomes are unknown. If you just went and picked someone randomly in this country, you might not know how they're going to vote for party one or party zero. And so we think of them as being a random variable. We think of the individual as being a random variable. Their outcome from a Bernoulli distribution is unknown. But really what's happening is these random variables are functions, these random variables take in Democrat and spit out one or zero, whichever labeling you want, it doesn't matter. And they take in this random variable X, takes in Republican and spits out the other one or zero, whichever Democrat is not labeled. We have spent most of our time in this world of distributions. There's a whole nother side to this world that is the data side. Now, the data side is the actual values that these random variables take on. So we often denote those with little x's. So that's like once you go out and ask somebody in a poll or whatever, once you ask somebody what they're going to vote for, then maybe this is a one and maybe this is a zero, and then maybe you got some more ones, and then maybe you got some zeros, all the way out to however many people you asked. So the data side is where the data actually shows up. And we imagine that the data come from these distributions. And the word we use for this is a sample. When you go out into the world and collect data, you are sampling data. Now, how do we connect these two worlds? Well, here's the crazy part. If you add up all of the data 
and divide by however many there are, what you're essentially doing is calculating a mean. And I'm going to put a squiggle under the x to say that this is a vector of observed data. This is a vector of ones and zeros. What I'm trying to do is replicate our code notation here. And the way we connect these two sides is by saying uh, a vector in R is just a variable. It's just got a name. There's no symbol to denote a vector in R. I'll show you once we get to examples in R. Now we connect the two sides of statistics by this crazy idea that we're not going to justify until later in the class that means of data converge to um, expectations. I'm going to say this like three more times because this is a crucial takeaway. We connect these two worlds of statistics, the data side to the distribution side, by this result in mathematical statistics that says, if you calculate the mean of a bunch of data, well, as your sample size goes to infinity, this mean will converge to an expectation of the random variable from which the data came. There is this crazy result in the world of mathematical statistics that says if you collect more and more and more and more data, that is your sample size goes to infinity, if you collect more and more and more data and you take the mean of that data, then the mean of the data will converge to the expectation of the distribution from which the data came. So if you have a large enough sample and you get the mean, the mean will help predict the values when sampling. That's exactly it. If you have enough data on the data side, then the mean is going to estimate for you expectations. If you have enough data, then the mean of the data will estimate for you expectations of specific distributions. An example would be like typing speed. That's an odd example I've never thought of, but that is an example of typing speed. So the idea would go like this, Jake, if I sat you down in front of a computer and I timed you for a minute, how many words you could type in a minute, then that would be like one observation, one data point. And then if I sat you down for another minute and timed in the next minute, how many words you could type in that minute, that would be another observation. And if I did this for capital N minutes, then we'd have capital N observations for how many words you could type in a minute. And if I took the mean of all of that, that mean would converge to the true average number of words per minute you, Jake, can type. It's an odd example, but I like it. This notation here is really abusing our lectures on random variables. It's essentially this. The only difference is you think of it like this. If this is the identity function of a random variable, then that's essentially just 
the expectation of the random variable itself, since the identity function returns its argument. So it's at this point that I'm starting to separate out expectation from the math notation from the statistics notation. The first half of this class, we did expectations as mathematicians do them. And the second half, we're relating it to random variables. I know it's confusing. Statistics has some of the worst notation in the world, but I'm trying to give you a good way to think about it. Unfortunately, the best way to think about it is confusing at first. That's why we're seeing this halfway through the semester. We have the rest of the semester to wrap our brains around this notation. Okay, let's do the rest in R. So here's um, what I'm going to do. I'm going to write, I'm going to use the function R binome, which is randomly generate data from the binomial distribution. We want to generate, let's say, 11 observations. And I'm going to make them be Bernoulli data. I'm going to pick p equal to 0 0.75 just to give us a fun example. So there we have it, 11 data points from a Bernoulli distribution with p equal to 0 0.75. So you can see more often than not, ones show up. Since 0.75 is bigger than 0.5, we're more likely to get ones than zeros. And Hayes, here is the answer to your question. All I have to do is declare that to be the variable x. And x is a vector. There is no special notation in R for making a vector. I just did that in math notation to remind us that there are multiple data points in that. So if I just take the mean of x, What's interesting is this is an estimate of the probability P. This is an estimate of the probability P. Because my sample was relatively small, the estimate was not particularly good. But as we just said in connecting the two sides of statistics, I can estimate better that probability P if I increase my sample size. And the argument works. I can estimate better this probability P if I increase my sample size. I can estimate better the probability P if I increase my sample size. I can, are you bored with this yet? estimate better the probability P if I increase my sample size. Soon, my computer is going to start complaining because I have so much data, it's hard for my computer to handle. So what we're doing in this class is we are learning what applied statisticians are estimating. Applied statisticians only ever work on the data side, and they're estimating specific things, very specific things. They are estimating expectations. What we're doing in this class is learning the specifics of estimating from the data side of statistics. This review might have been a little intense. These are all things we've seen before. I'm just saying them in one concise picture. So if you need practice with this, remember this, uh, 
lecture is recorded. It's now 1050 on my computer. I'm going to stop recording. I'll stick around for the next five minutes if we have follow up questions. But look, this example was really easy. You all can replicate this on your machines so that you can see how the estimation of these expectations happens.